Greetings and welcome back to room 303 at our Talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in the Calamus section and we turn now to a little poem called Not Heat Flames Up and Consumes. We've commented already on the fact that Whitman loves this kind of strange syntactical order to try and make you go, wait, 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 what's going on? And this one will, of course, remind us as well of the poem Not Heaving from My Red Breast Only, where that not, not, not is going to be played. We're going to get a similar kind of game getting played here. Now, our assumption is that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, um, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, that you've been reading our stuff from the very beginning together with us, uh, from the inscriptions all the way up through roots and leaves themselves alone. Now, as we often want to do with our background information, we'll go to... Um, 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 to our Nortons, and um, he, uh, we're, we're told the following. This Calamus number 14 poem, unchanged since it took its present title in 1867, was originally uh, number one in the Roman numeral series already referred to, and it carried the title Calamus Leaves, altered from a still earlier title, Live Oak with Moss. We've mentioned that that Live Oak with Moss was a title uh, a number of times. Now, I, I have pointed this out to you, and I've, as I've said, I've refrained from having too many moments of this type of thing. But I just want to take you back in time, because there's these amazing echoes back in time. And I want to start with starting from Pominok, from the inscriptions uh, section, um, uh, number six. Do you guys remember these set of lines? I will sing the song of companionship. I will show what alone must finally compact these, I believe. These are to be found their own ideal of manly love, indicating it in me. I will therefore let flame from me the burning fires that were threatening to consume me. I will lift what has too long kept down these smoldering fires. I will give them complete abandonment. I will write an evangel poem of comrades and of love. For who but I should understand love with all its sorrow and joy, and who but I should be the poet of comrades. Now, Hearing that, you'll understand and hear the resonant echoes of this poem. Not heat flames up and consumes. Not sea waves hurry in and out. Not the air delicious and dry. The air of ripe summer bears lightly along white down balls of myriads of seeds. Wafted, sailing gracefully to drop where they may. Not these, oh, none of these more than the flames of me, consuming, burning for his love whom I love. Oh, none more than I, hurrying in and out, does the tide hurry, seeking something and never give up. Oh, I the same. Oh, nor down balls, nor perfumes, nor the high rain emitting clouds are born through the open air any more than my soul is born through the open air wafted in all directions oh love for friendship of you now the reason that we read the starting from Pominock passage 6 of course we lectured it in full elsewhere at learnstrong.net in the talks with Walt list is to help you to begin to hear these echoes. And I hope that you're reading your own copy of Leaves of Grass, and I hope that you're annotating as you go. And I hope that you will point out to yourself already this word not is going to be repeated at least four times in a row. Notice, we'll begin with heat flames up and consumes, and we're immediately reminded of the previous poem, Roots and Leaves Themselves Alone, when he said, if you bring the warmth of the sun to the seeds that are these songs, these poems, we're playing the same game again of sun and flame and heat. He says, it isn't though that that consumes, or sea waves hurrying in and out. This will be the, the, the word picture, and we've seen this in a number of already of these poems, and the ocean poems as they're sometimes referred to, out of the cradle endlessly rocking will come to mind. Not the air delicious. Seven times the word delicious gets used in Calamus. It says something for us, doesn't it? And dry, delicious and dry. The air of ripe summer, everything is about growth and dynamism in Leaves of Grass, bears lightly along white down balls of myriads of seeds. And again, these songs are, these poems are in fact seeds, as we saw from Roots and Leaves, the, the poem we just finished with, right? And then he uses this word, wafted. You'll remember that we saw this in Song of Myself, passage 39. 
sailing gracefully. Remember, he called them sailors. He was talking about to the, uh, to the readers in uh, Roots and Leaves themselves, sailing right gracefully to drop where they may. We cannot help but think of Shelley's Ode to the West Wind in that first sonnet there, right, uh, as he's talking about the West Wind, destroyer and preserver and, and all of that, right? Not these, oh, and then notice the repetition of oh, 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 over, as we will see at the end of that last section of starting from Pomodoc, right? Oh, he says, none of these more than the flames of me. Now, put it in your notes. Fire for Whitman is going to be inspiration, taking us all the way back to the ancient myth of Prometheus. Fire here, taking us back to the ancient Egyptian myth of the phoenix. For Whitman, he loves this idea that inspiration is like a fire. Notice he talks about it consuming. This word consuming is used one time in all of Leaves of Grass, and it's right here. Consumed, obviously, a couple of times, but consuming burning, and again, we, we just read, starting from Pomodoc Passage 6, for this very reason, burning for his love whom I love. Oh, none more than I, hurrying in and out. In other words, very much, inspiration is very much like the tide coming up onto the beach. Does the tide hurry, seeking something? And if you'll think about it, all of our study of Lisa Grass has been about seeking. We, we want something. Whitman wants something as the poet he longs for readers. Obviously, readers long for something as well, which is why we keep reading these amazing poems, right? He will say it this way. Does the tide hurry, seeking something and never give up? Oh, I the same. Oh, nor down balls, nor perfumes. We're familiar with the use of perfumes in the previous poem. Nor the high rain emitting clouds are borne through the open air any more than my soul is borne through the open air. Now we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this open air when we get to Song of the Open Road. Um, wafted, he uses a second time in this poem, in all directions, oh, love, again, five times now with this oh, love for friendship for you. And then he elicits, right, you the reader uh, uh, to be his friend and his lover. Well, what's actually going on in a poem like this? I think this is a poem about inspiration. And I think Whitman was very interested in the idea that he felt inspired at a certain point in his third decade to start putting together these sets of lines. And to that degree, inspiration is like a fire, right? That is to say, it's the sun from the previous poem, isn't it? It obviously is the Platonist idea of the sun in Republic 7 in the cave allegory. At 2B, Again, the word not used four times, these repetitions, very much like uh, not heaving from my rib breast only. At 3a, I've mentioned Song of the Open Road in many ways, as I have said. We will read all that we've read up to this point, including the rest of the poems of Calamus, just to get ready for Song of the Open Road and Brooklyn Ferry. Those are, in some ways, the two poems everything is gesturing towards. We'll speak about that one later. I want to mention as well in 3A, James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, a text that we loved uh, in 303, and the way in which Joyce will talk about inspiration and the epiphany there. Of course, we would be remiss to point out how Emerson, Thoreau, and of course Emily Dickinson love to talk about the questions that stand behind inspiration and why it is that it happens at all. Think about what we said in, for example, Emerson's American Scholar and Emerson's essay, The Poet. Finally, at 3B, what is your flame? What is your inspiration, a, a way to try and own a poem like this? What is it that for you makes you hot with inspiration and desire for growth? And are you, in fact, growing? Are you burning? That is to say, are you longing for the next stage of your growth? And I hope our study of these poems is helping that happen for you. Thank you.